So the much anticipated Susan Ray Ross. Yeah, I f I'm a little nervous because I hate to tell you, but partnerships are really hard. And I feel like my speakers before have made a great case, but um, I am here to talk about challenges. And um, I actually have been working on a blog piece about the secrets of failed partnerships. And for some reason, I can't get anyone to talk to me. So I feel very, um, I guess it's this one. I feel very compelled uh, when I get asked to make these presentations on partnership to number one, say, what are we talking about? There are so many different words that we use to describe partnerships, and they don't all mean the same thing to, the, to people. So I feel very compelled that I at least have to start with my own definitions. You don't have to agree with them. But um, particularly for me, I think that, and I've heard people use collaboration and partnership interchangeably. So um, one of the things that I like to do a lot is kayak. And so I find that it's easier to kind of talk about the difference between collaboration and partnership when I'm kayaking. So if you think about collaboration, it means that you know we're both in our own boat. We both have our same objectives. Um, I do a lot of work in maternal health, so maternal health requires a lot of different things. You might be working on antenatal care, I'm working on delivery care. We're going down the same river, but I'm not really gonna wait for you to do training for me. Um, I'm gonna do what I need to do and, and reach my results. Whereas in partnership, we're in the same boat. And we gotta figure out how to get there. Because if you think about it, it's really this continuum of engagement. And if you think about collaboration, what collaboration means is that I have my own resources, I have my own results. And if there's a way that we can work together and it's beneficial, we'll do it. In partnership, we have a set of independent results. I need you to achieve my objectives. I need your resources, I need your skills, and I need your networks. And so we have to figure out how to jointly make decisions because we have to be able to get down the river together. And so I'm only going to talk about what's in this yellow box, but there's lots of times that we talk to people and we actually don't end up having a partnership, right? We either there's some way that we don't negotiate, um, it's not the right opportunity. So, you know, you have lots of discussions with people, and you might actually collaborate with them, but you might not enter a, an actual partnership with them. So what I'm going to talk about are these three or four steps that are in the partnership phase. Understanding that partnerships have life cycles, and you need to look at benchmarks and determine if the partnership is still meeting the value that you want it to meet. And it might be that you say, you know, after three years, we either achieved our objectives or this isn't working out, so we need to go a different way. But the idea is that you're constantly assessing what that partnership is. So this is a framework that was um, developed back in the 90s, and I like it because it's pretty simple. Um, and, and basically it talks about three different um, time frames. So it talks about kind of the initiation, which is where you're doing, setting up the partnership. It talks about three different levels. So it talks about people, it talks about goals, and this was in 1995, so it talks about capacity building. I'm sure we would talk about knowledge management or some other new terminology. But the people part is really about who are the stakeholders. So it could be that trade unions are um, key stakeholders. It could be that healthcare workers are key stakeholders. It could be that regulators are key stakeholders. So really trying to understand who those influencers are and who the, um, and my understanding is that these slides will all be up on the website so you don't have to worry about it. The last point is the issue of who, how do you share credit? Right? So if you're in a partnership and at the end your partner says, oh, I did all the work, it's, you're not going to feel very good about the partnership. The second piece that I'm really starting to understand more and more is that, you know, we all talk about we need to have mutual respect and trust and shared vision. Nobody is against saving children. I work on a project called Saving Mothers Giving Life that I'll talk about in a little bit, but nobody is against saving women's lives. What people are against is, oh, you want me to work in the same districts that you work in? 
oh, you don't really want to do that. I mean, we want to save women lives, but we want to do our own thing in our own place. Well, that's the collaboration model. That's not being in the same boat. So these sub-goals, right, the big goals about saving the environment or saving women and children, nobody agree disagrees to those goals. The goals that people disagree with are, how am I going to spend my money? How is this actually going to change the way that I work? Because people don't really want to change the way they work. And it's all these, what I would consider, sub-goals that you have to get agreement on. And then lastly, they talk about capacity building. And what I usually tell people is that you can either spend the time up front to understand what your, your partner wants, how they operate, or if you don't do that, you'll spend a lot more time doing damage control later on. So what I want you to do, because I know tomorrow, and I'm sorry I can't be here tomorrow, is that you're going to really look at these partnership case studies and really kind of delve in. So what I really want you to do is have some key questions to be able to look at these partnerships. So if we take this initiation phase, um, I've already talked a little bit about the, the critical stakeholders. So let's say that you decide trade unions are a key stakeholder. Do those trade unions actually represent informal workers? And if informal workers are the people that you're really needing to capture, then are trade unions the appropriate stakeholders that you should be working with? So it's really trying to understand, and people say, oh, you know, we don't want to talk about the details. Well, you know, the devil lies in the details. And that's usually what, or what makes or breaks partnerships. Um, this issue of how do you succeed? How, do, how, will measure, well, how will success be measured? You know, that's very different for a pharmaceutical company than it is for a nonprofit. So how do you come up with measures that are mutually beneficial for both of you? And then this question of how, does the part, how are you going to manage the partnership? And I'm going to talk about governance structures in a little bit. During the execution phase, um, so then this question of who are the stakeholders and how are the stakeholders actually being heard? You know, if you're trying to get the voices of informal workers, what mechanisms are you going to be able to make sure that you're getting those voices to be heard? Um, how are disagreements going to be managed? I tell everyone, you know, partnerships are a lot like marriage, and you need to figure out how you're going to fight before you actually get in a fight. And I can tell you that there are a lot of partnership agreements that don't have exit strategies. I am in the place right now where I am at all of our leadership council members are having to redo their pledges, which has not been a very pleasant conversation because they haven't been able to meet them. So, you know, really thinking through when you're still friends and you still like each other, how are we going to actually manage our grievances? Governance structures. So this is a very simplistic um, representation. It's much more complicated this in real life. But if we think about the number of partners that you have in a partnership, and then the complexity kind of indicates how, how formal your governance structure is. So for example, if you um, take an organization like GAIN that has many different corporate partners, many different NGOs, is housed in a Swiss foundation dealing with food fortification and development of new products and, and uh, food or, or agriculture security. The topics that they're managing are much more complex. The number of organizations that they're working with is much more complex. So they actually have to have a more formal governance structure, as opposed to um, City Year and Timberland. City Year is a, a local uh, national education organization. Timberland obviously sells boots and um, apparel. And so it's just those two organizations. So it's much easier to figure out what kind of governance structure they need to have. And so the idea is people need to start thinking about these things when they're actually designing their partnerships. And then lastly, this issue about um, how are we going to share success? Are we going to have press releases that have both organizations or several organizations' press releases? And if you're going to have joint press releases, who in each organization has to approve those press releases? And I can tell you working with corporations trying to get press releases approved is quite a challenge. Um, 
you know, how are you going to tell? <laughs> Stop smiling, Clary. How are you going to tell if this partnership's been successful or not? What are the measurements that you're looking at? And not just the outcomes. I've been in several partnerships where we have reduced infant mortality. We have achieved our objectives. And no one in that partnership speaks to each other anymore. Personally, I don't consider that a successful partnership. Depends how you define success. Um, and then the question is, is this partnership still creating enough value, or does it need to be redesigned? So if we look at something like the Kimberly process, which was set up to track blood diamonds, um, they were very successful in many perspectives. Um, and one of the things was is that they were going after these very large mines, um, identifying the source of the diamond, being able to track that. So if you bought a diamond at Tiffany's, you would know exactly where that diamond came from. Well, what ended up happening was people started going through informal mines, right? So the whole way that this partnership was designed and the way that it was the problem that it was trying to address, it basically addressed the problem, but then the problem changed. So then the question was, well, is this partnership constructed correctly to be able to address this new problem? Does it make sense to continue the way it's going? Does it need some other kind of structure to be able to move forward? So really being able to say, you know, sometimes you can declare victory and go home and say, you know, we need to think of a different way of doing this. So this is the partnership that I work on. Um, I will tell you that it's uh, color-coded. It doesn't make it any easier. But the yellow um, circles are the people on the leadership council. There's a formal uh, memorandum of understanding. And simple things, like when I say I would like to sit down and do our work plan for the year, of the seven organizations, five of them have different fiscal years and different calendar years. So I have to negotiate with them and say, oh, well, we're going to do a calendar year from January to December or we're going to use the PEPFAR calendar, which goes from March to April, or we're going to use the USAID calendar. And then I have to get the money to flow at the same time that we want to do the activities. So while I agree that that's a detailed level, that's kind of important for what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. If you look at the arrows on the bottom, I don't know if there's a pointer, but so the green arrows are the funding flows, and the purple arrows are the reporting flows. So you can see that just for the US government, so the green box is the PEPFAR funding. Um, the kind of orangest box is other CDC funding that's not PEPFAR. And the purple is other USAID funding. That doesn't include any of our private sector partners. It goes to 30 different implementing partners. And so we have quarterly M&E requirements that people will report certain, we have 30 core indicators that our implementing partners have to report, regardless of who they're funded by. Um, and we do financial reporting to our leadership council every quarter. So I have a lot of hair dye that I have to use. Um, <laughs> very nice thank you. Um, so I find it very useful to map out these partnerships to really understand what the relationships are, because I think that that's partly where you can understand where the challenges are. And, and I don't necessarily mean challenges in a bad way. I think that you know, we all understand it's easy to miscommunicate. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges for any partnership is, is having clear expectations. Sometimes we think we have clear expectations, and we really don't. Um, and, I would say any partnership that's even been successful has some challenges. Um, so lastly, if we go back to the kayaking, because I like to kayak. So if we think about what the challenges are for partnerships, we have internal challenges, right? So if we think about early days, um, there was a partnership between the Environmental Defense Fund and McDonald's, and it was looking at how to change the plastic containers that McDonald's used to have. The biggest critics of that partnership were all the other environmental NGOs. They took EDF to task and said, how dare you work with McDonald's? You know, you've like sold us all out. Um, so sometimes the internal challenges come from your peers. Sometimes they come from 
unexpected. I thought you were going to paddle right, and you thought I was going to paddle left, and now we're not on course. Um, you know, I think a lot of times when, particularly on the corporate side, if a corporate is, uh, goes through a merger and acquisition, there's a new CEO, you know, priorities change. And that happens on nonprofit sides as well. Um, I think it's sometimes more publicly known on the for-profit side. But then it's not just about the partners. Then there's also, oops, external challenges. <laughs> so there was a partnership between Rainforest Alliance and Chiquita. Well, they, the first person has jumped out of the boat, so. Um, but there was a partnership between, and this kind of gets to some of the regulation uh, kind of work. So there was a partnership um, between Chiquita Bananas and Rainforest Alliance. And the partnership was quite strong, but the OECD actually changed how they thought about um, GMO and bananas. And there was a big issue about Chiquita not actually being able to sell their bananas in Europe. So it was a huge issue for the business, but it was also an issue for the partnership. And so a lot of times, you know, these, whether it's a regulation, whether it's, um, you know, if you imagine that you were the Nature Conservancy when there was a BP oil spill, and you had had a partnership with BP for 10 years, BP had been paying you to do what your mission was, but then BP was on the news, as we all remember, that was quite a challenge for the, both BP, the Nature Conservancy, and the relationship of their partnership. And one of the big challenges for the Nature Conservancy is that even though they were very transparent and very public about this partnership, their members never took notice. And so when they found out they were partnering with an oil company, most of their members were not very happy about that, considering it's an environmental NGO. So, I hope that this actually provides you some questions and some things to think about tomorrow. I would love to, I moderate a, a LinkedIn group called NGO Corporate Partnerships that has about 800, uh, and it's not just on NGO Corporate Partnerships, on public-private partnerships as well. Um, but there's about 800 members, and I would love to invite any of you who are interested to join. Thank you very much. Can I just ask you, in your governance partners' X, Y axis, where would your own uh, saving mothers giving life be? I think it would be fairly high up because um, we have a seven-member leadership council. We have a 20-member operations committee, and then we have five technical committees underneath that. So it's a pretty um, formalized structure to be able to make decisions and move things forward. All right. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Um, Thanks. Thank One of the successes, I think, of, of the Saving Mothers Partnership has been the secretariat structure. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, because in some cases we have secretariats that are neutral bodies. In this case, the secretariat rotates between um, the different partners. I wonder if you could just say a little bit more about the role of the Secretariat and how it sure. functions. So I, I have to um, give full disclaimer because I am the 50% part-time Secretariat Director. Um, and uh, initially when Saving Mothers Giving Life was conceived, and what I should actually say also is that it was um, launched by Secretary at the time Hillary Clinton, um, it was supported by Merck. And there was a full-time person. Um, there was several contracts uh, with uh, uh, communications organizations, um, ad companies. And uh, when there was the first significant um, challenge to the partnership, Merck said, we don't want to do the secretariat anymore. Um, it was a challenge uh, from a funding perspective because AID, you know, mechanism is king. And so actually um, I was asked to take on the part-time secretary position, but Merck actually paid me for a year until AID could get a mechanism to be able to pay me. And um, there's also a, so the way that we kind of think about it is there's, because there's five U.S. government agencies, um, so it's state, USAID, CDC, DOD, and Peace Corps. Um, there's a U.S. 
lead, U.S. agency lead that is from USAID, and then there's a 50% um, secretary person who coordinates USG and all the other non-USG partners. Um, I think that, uh, I think it's interesting. I think there's a lot of really interesting things to think about as far as secretariats. The UN Foundation is a secretariat oftentimes. Um, but I do think as you, if you think of something like the global, the global road safety partnership, which um, one of the challenges with that was that nobody wanted to take responsibility for roads because, or car accidents, because is it the car manufacturer's fault? Is it the road's fault? Is it the country's fault? So uh, the World Bank and actually Diamond Chrysler have done a lot of work, and so the secretariat for that actually sits in the World Bank. Um, but I think this is where the more industries and the more complex the topics are that you're dealing with, the more you actually need a formal structure. And unfortunately, that's what people usually want to cut first. Um, but it doesn't function otherwise. Yeah, thank you. Pat, did you have a question? One question, Pat Daly. Hey, Pat. Yeah, thanks. That was really good. Um, I think it shows the importance of trust and compromise, which we've heard a bit about, and you mentioned it again, which is really important. Um, one thing, I just comment, question, is really, sometimes you enter these partnerships with a very specific objective goal that, that a small group of partners agrees upon and the partnership goes well and then it kind of advances and suddenly the objectives and goals change they become larger and new partners come come in and I think what we've seen is that's where the leadership is so important because sometimes new partners come in with very large voices and can shift things and if there isn't really a strong leadership that's well grounded in what was agreed upon in the beginning I mean it can expand but it can really get derailed. And yeah, and I think, you know, one of the things that we're actually working on right now at Saving Mothers Giving Life is writing an operations manual, partly because the history of it is so important and what people have agreed to. Um, and if people aren't there anymore that have agreed to those things and there's no paper trail, it's really challenging. I have to say, I think that um, Pink Ribbon, rib, Red Ribbon, I think, has one of the best um, partnership agreements because they have many companies that are competitors. And so they have very clear entrance and exit. I haven't actually seen it, but this is what I've been told because we kind of went around and interviewed several other secretariats. Um, and so they have very clear kind of, if you want to leave, then these are the conditions, which I think is really important. I think the other thing that I haven't seen a lot, but I think we need to think about is how could you be like an associate member? Um, because one of the challenges is that some of these organizations are quite small, and they're like, we just don't have the ability to participate in 10 different committees. Um, and so we, I think we haven't figured that out yet, but I think the idea of if you could have like lead, um, you know, like for us, maybe you're on the leadership council, but you're not on, you're on some of the other committees, but not on leadership council, because there's usually a price tag as well. Um, initially, when Saving Mothers Giving Life was uh, developed, it was $10 million uh, to be on the uh, leadership council. So I think there's still lots and lots of room to better understand these structures. And I think there's a lot of work that has to happen on evaluate processes of evaluation in the partnership. OK, thank you very much. And finally, Carolyn, we started a little bit late, so we're, we're OK. And we can, we can uh, run over a little bit. 